Plants worldwide provide tens of billions of tons of wood and fiber that shelter and clothe us, and they provide us paper. So let's talk about some important plant materials because that will help us understand some important differences between animals and plants, as well as the differences between woody plants, such as trees and shrubs, and non-woody plants, such as grasses, and ferns, and other species we call herbs or herbaceous. First, let's delve into wood. Wood timber is produced by many species of plants, including the broadleaf trees we call hardwoods, such as this magnificent oak and ash and maple and many other species, and needle-leaved softwoods, or conifers, such as pine, spruce, and cedar. We'll go into more detail about the differences between conifers and hardwoods in future lessons. So what is wood? Wood is made up of plant cells. Strong plant cells, like this one illustrated on the right, differ from our comparatively weeny animal cells, like the one on the left, in having tough cell walls. Animal cells have membranes, but not walls. All plant cells are made up of three primary compounds that give them their tough yet flexible character. Cellulose, the most abundant organic compound on Earth, hemicellulose, and lignin. Remember all those sugars? like the glucose molecules shown here that are produced by plant photosynthesis? Well, string all those glucose molecules together into a chain or a polymer and you get cellulose. Think celery, those strings of tough tissue that sometimes get stuck in your teeth and you'll get a good sense of the flexibility and toughness of cellulose. The tissues of woody plants are more rigid than other plants because their cell walls consist of higher amounts of lignin, which is essentially the glue that binds all the cellulose together. Now take a tree in cross-section and you'll see two kinds of wood. Here's a cross-section of a fir tree. The center of the trunk is a harder, dead part of the tree called the heartwood, in which the tubes, called xylem, you getting ready to win a Scrabble game? These tubes pipe water and nutrients up from its roots to its leaves, and they've blocked up, essentially, and have stopped working. Surrounding the heartwood, there is a moist living layer called sapwood, packed with functioning xylem tubes. Around the outer edge of the sapwood and the trunk is a thin, active layer called the cambium, where the tree is growing outward by a little bit each year. In the spring and summer, when the tree is growing vigorously, the cambium expands rapidly, putting on layers of large cells with thin cell walls. In the late summer and fall, tree growth slows down, and the new cambium cells that the tree produces are smaller and denser, with thick cell walls. So each year, you get alternating concentric areas of contrasting cells, which are called growth rings. In this cross-section of the trunk, you'll see the annual rings, one new one added each year. Count up the number of rings you see, and you get the age of the tree. Growth rates vary from year to year, too, so it's possible to go back in time to see which years were good for the tree, and in which years it grew more slowly. Mature woody plants also tend to have an outermost protective layer that we call bark. Bark is not wood. Rather, the outer bark is mostly dead tissue uh, that's produced by a type of cambium called cork. The dead cells contain a fatty substance called suberin that makes them impermeable to water and also gives the tree a lot of strength. The features of the bark, like its color, texture, and thickness, change as the tree ages. The bark of an older tree can look very different from the bark of a younger one. You can tell many tree species apart by looking carefully at the characteristic bark they produce. How many of these barks of common trees are familiar to you? Take your time. Cut vertically through a tree trunk, and you'll see lines inside, running parallel to the trunk, formed by the xylem tubes. These form the inner structure of the wood and give it its unique grain. The beautiful patterns of that grain are hugely valued by woodworkers worldwide. 
The vessels also give the wood great strength against compression, so they can bear heavy loads. That's why vertical timbers can be used to frame houses and other buildings. Now, let's look at the three major categories of woody plants that we see. Trees, shrubs, and woody vines, which are also called lianas. Trees are our tallest woody plants. New England species can reach 150 feet or more tall. That's tiny me for scale with a huge red oak in central Massachusetts. Trees typically have one main stem or trunk, but sometimes if the young trunk is damaged by insects or storms, the tree will grow a few replacement trunks or stump sprouts, so it can fool you. But usually one of those new trunks is larger and taller than the others. It is called a leader. Shrubs are generally smaller than mature trees, usually only reaching 20 to 30 feet in height, max. Of course, young trees or saplings can start out smaller than your average shrub, so it's important to look at the growth form of the plant. Shrubs usually have several stems that originate from the base of the plant, whereas trees tend to have one main trunk. Lianas have a vine-like growth form. That is, they climb on other vegetation or structures to boost their leaves up into the canopy to get sunlight. Some of the most common examples of lianas in our region are wild grapes, shown here, or Virginia creeper, or the invasive oriental bittersweet. An important liana to learn right off the bat is poison ivy, Toxicodendron radicans. It can look like a shrub in its young years, but eventually it can grow into a large, tough liana. Its leaves come in sets of three, and are usually shiny, vibrant to dark green, turning red in the fall, and sometimes its young spring leaves are also red or maroon. Now, the liana stem that you see on the right has lots of hairs that it uses to attach itself to a climbing surface. Don't touch the stem or leaves at any time. They're poisonous even in winter. And later on in the course, you'll get more introduction to this plant. Okay, so now we have a sense of what a woody plant is made of. What's an herbaceous plant? Well, it doesn't produce wood, of course, by definition. And it's usually not as tough as a woody plant. Try squeezing a tree trunk or a twig like that one on the left. There's no give. If you squeeze a stem of an herbaceous plant like the fern on the right, it eventually gives way. In our region, many herbaceous plants die back all the way to the ground. Exceptions are some evergreen herbaceous plants like a Christmas fern, shown on the left, or partridge berry, shown on the right, which keep their shape and green leaves and are actually photosynthesizing, albeit slowly, all year long. Now, as we've seen in a previous lesson, herbaceous plants give us essential products. Everything from medicine, such as digitalis, source of heart medication, poppy, source of painkillers, and golden seal, a native plant of the eastern U.S., which is used to treat cold symptoms and digestive discomfort and other maladies, but which can be over-harvested in parts of its range. Now, if you're wearing cotton while viewing this slideshow, you can thank a plant. Or... If you're wearing linen, you can thank a plant, flax. And even if you're wearing wool, okay, wool doesn't come from plants, but from the animals that eat those plants. In your next assignment, we'll ask you to go out and look at a favorite tree in or near your backyard and tell us about its bark.